Hello and welcome to America's Heartland. I'm Paul Ryan and welcome to Monticello, home of one of our best known and best loved founding fathers. Thomas Jefferson was more than a president, a statesman, a philosopher, and a defender of democracy. He was a farmer and here at his Virginia plantation, Jefferson voiced both his love of the land and his hopes for a new nation. Work on Monticello's magnificent main house began in 1769 and was largely completed in 1784. But it was his 5,000 acre farm that most ignited Jefferson's passion for research and fascination with the natural world. He grew and experimented with hundreds of different kinds of fruits, vegetables, and flowers, some brought to him by Lewis and Clark, others from around the world. Much of his plantation was divided into 40-acre parcels managed by resident overseers and Jefferson's 150 slaves, a fact of history that is today considered one of the most tragic aspects of the man and the era. Despite that indelible stain on his past shared by so many others of his time, there remained in Thomas Jefferson a profound respect for agriculture and the values and ideals of the American farmer. As he wrote to James Madison in 1787, I think our governments will remain virtuous for many centuries, as long as they are chiefly agricultural. Well, there's no question, you know, he regarded himself at times as first and foremost a, a farmer. And Jefferson said, for example, that the greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. You know, Jefferson was primarily a vegetarian. He said he ate meat. Peter Hatch has spent more than three decades studying Thomas Jefferson the farmer. He never ceases to marvel at our third president's passion for agriculture and experimentation. That interest reached full bloom here in Jefferson's thousand foot long kitchen garden and the fruit orchard and the vineyard he planted nearby. In some ways, that idea that the noble farmer represented the best of the American Republic was a real concept that Jefferson um, pushed time and time again in his political life. Uh, he felt that the uh, farmers represented independence and self-reliance, all the values that he needed uh, to uh, make this a great country. In this open-air laboratory, Jefferson planted more than 330 varieties of vegetables and 170 varieties of fruit. He was an avid collector and grower of flowers and ornamental plants. But his garden was also a kind of Ellis Island for ag products from as far away as Europe, India, and Asia, and as close by as America's frontier. Meriwether Lewis collected Indian crops of corns and beans and tobaccos and squashes, and these were crops that were grown by the northern Plains Indians uh, in a really harsh climate. And Jefferson, you know, grew some of these plants here at Monticello, being uh, probably the first uh, European to grow these plants in eastern North America. This is a, a, t a variety of lettuce that Jefferson grew called uh, Brown Dutch. Mm -hmm. And he planted particularly in the wintertime for uh, use through the winter months. Only about 10% of Jefferson's original vegetable varieties exist today. But walk these gardens and you can still find direct descendants of his early species, like Egyptian or tree onions, notable for having bulbs both atop the stem and beneath the soil. Caretakers here at Monticello let many vegetables and flowers go to seed, seeds you can buy and plant to help propagate his legacy. Walking where Jefferson walked. Right. You know, a lot of people think about that. I think about that. Right. How do you see that? Well, you know, I, I love uh, the things Jefferson said. He was, a, he was a beautiful writer, and he said that in gardening, uh, the failure of one thing is repaired by the success of another. Uh, a great line that not only is, uh, encapsulates uh, gardening, but also life in general. In fact, Jefferson's life is notable for its great achievements and its failures. He left the presidency in 1809, largely disappointed with American politics. Despite relentless experimenting, he never did succeed in growing wine grapes, he died deeply in debt. But historians say for the last 17 years of his life, this elder statesman worked Monticello's red clay soil and tended these gardens, flower beds, and fields with a quiet and profound satisfaction and a kind of peace that only comes to those who work and love the land. It's a great honor and a privilege, but a, a very humbling one to try and recreate the, the gardens that existed 200 years ago. This is Jefferson's garden. I sometimes think of this as the first real American garden. 